All right, so I'm going to keep this uh, relatively brief. I thought that the, the discussion on the last tutorial was so uh, entertaining and uh, in, in, involved that I, I, I didn't really want, want to cut it off. And uh, I, I figured that what I wanted to talk about today I, I could do in, in, a, in a shorter or longer period of time. So I, I think I'm... I'm going to try to take maybe half half hour to 35, 40 minutes, and then if if, if discussion after that goes on a while, then that, then that's cool. Otherwise, uh, it it doesn't. So, in in the spirit of the previous two tutorials, I'm going to give some thoughts aimed at unraveling or unfolding what may be some of the, the general principles underlying a, a, AGI. And as I said in my remarks at the introduction of the conference this morning, I think that's one of the big values this community can have in, in the world now. Like even as the pursuit of AGI becomes more and more mainstream and, and popular, there's still not that much focus going on to understanding, you know, what what general intelligence is and what structures and processes really lie at the core of, of general intelligence. And, you know, there are people writing about this from a purely philosophical or mathematical or conceptual point of view, but I'm of the mind that, that these foundational issues are going to be understood best by a combination of theory and practice, where you build stuff and experiment, and then you theorize and try to understand and build it and, and experiment more. But doing that combination of building and experimenting stuff, along with abstractly theorizing and trying to understand what's going on, I mean, the, there's not that many people doing that in an, in an AGI context now, and there's a whole bunch of people in in this room who are who are doing that, which is which is pretty exciting. So I'm I'm gonna run through a few different lines of of reasoning and, and thinking aimed at understanding what general AI is in general. And there's going to be some overlap with Alexei's talk and some, some stuff that, that's different. And I'll tie this in a little bit to my work with OpenCog and just some more recent work I'm doing in collaboration with others and combining deep neural nets with symbolic systems in, in, in OpenCog just to give some concrete grounding to the to the general ideas but m mostly I'll keep it fairly conceptual there's some papers in the proceedings of last year's or this year's AGI conference that have a bunch of math and equations in them pertinent to this and I'll mention those papers so people who like formalism can can look them up but I'm, I'm not going to go through too much of math formalism here just to keep 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 it quick and, and relatively simple. So I also want to mention an upcoming symposium, which I'm, I'm not organizing or anything. I think I was on the program committee. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure if I'll be able to go because I have so much stuff going on. But on a similar vein, uh, John, John Laird and Paul Rosenblum and some others from the Cognitive Architecture community are doing a AAAI symposium in November called the Standard Model of the Mind, and I think that that's an interesting choice because if you if you know particle physics, you know the Standard Model, you know it, it, it encompasses encompasses electromagnetic force, strong and weak nuclear force. It doesn't cover gravity, and it's one of the ugliest, most unwieldy models you'll ever see. No one likes it, but it's really accurate and explains a lot, right? So, I, I mean, that's both a big ambition and it's interesting because the standard model in physics leaves out some important stuff and it's got a hideous number of variables and, and parameters. And I actually think that's a kind of cool way to formulate it because, I mean, when I try to find the general theory of general intelligence, 
A, I know I'm leaving out some things, like I'm, I'm intentionally leaving out the phenomenology of consciousness. I mean, I think, I think that's an interesting topic. I've written some things about it. I've thought about it a lot, but that just seems a little, a little bit different to me. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about the functional and behavioral properties of intelligent systems. And I'm not yet trying to find an incredibly simple and elegant theory because I'd rather have a theory first and then the simple and elegant theory will, will come afterwards. So in those ways, the metaphor of a standard model from physics is sort of apropos. I don't especially agree with John Laird's kind of sore-based idea of what the standard model of the mind should be, but that, 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 that's another topic. and. This, their symposium isn't just on the organizer's model either. So the first thing I want to run through is based on a, a paper that Matt Eclay and I published in a book called Theoretical Foundations of Artificial General Intelligence. And I, I like the title of that book. I came up with it as a sort of pun because each chapter gave a separate theoretical foundation for for general intelligence. So it was it was an edited volume because there's not much agreement on what the theoretical foundations are. But in the chapter that Matt and I wrote, what I tried to do was to come up with, in essence, a bunch of box and line diagrams that summarized what cognitive science now thinks the decomposition of human like thought into components looks like and it did strike me that this is a genuine advance made during my lifetime like when I started looking at cognitive science in the early 1980s there was less of an agreement on what the boxes and lines diagram of the human mind should look like and that now there's much more agreement which comes out of a host of different cognitive psychology experiments and and AI system prototyping and so forth. So in that paper, we start with a high-level diagram, which is a slight modification of a diagram made by, by Aaron Sloman, one of, one of the grand old men of, of, of cognitive science. And Aaron broke down everything in the mind into a few higher-level components. So we have working memory, we have long-term memory, we have reactive processes like reflexes, immediate movements, we have deliberative processes, more reflective thinking, metacognitive processes, which is thinking about thinking and including thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking and, and, and so forth. We have emotion and then self-modeling and social modeling, motivation and action selection. Reinforcement learning, I don't think was in Sloman's diagram, we, we, we added that, and of course you, you have perception and action. So. At this very high level, not many people are going to argue that the human mind brain is not doing these, these things. You can argue about how useful it is to make a bunch of boxes and lines depicting them. What, what I next did was sort of look at each of those diagrams and, and blow it out. So for working memory, actually I found that <coughs> Stan Franklin's cognitive architecture, LIDA, while not a tremendously functional software system in its implementation, the architecture diagram for LIDA was closely based on the, you know, Bernard Barr's models of cognitive neuropsychology and, and seemed, seemed like it broke down how human working memory works pretty well, looking into sensory memory, perceptual associative memory, transient episodic memory, and active procedural memory, and you have you have a bunch of local workspaces associated with these different subsets of working memory. And then he views there as being a sort of global workspace, which is full of, of everything that is getting a lot of attention in the mind at, at a given time. And if, if you wanted to connect this with IIT and, and, and PHI, as, as we just heard about, I mean, in, in this sort of model of working memory, what, what's happening is there's some broadcasting throughout the brain and everything that is receiving that broadcast is sort of synchronized in some way. And that, that that's and is then part of the, the global workspace, which is being summoned into attention at that moment. And then 
this coordination and synchronization of disparate things, which are being called the global workspace, I mean, that's what would give you a high degree of, 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 of phi in the integra integrated information theory. So the, they're sort of looking at the same thing from two different perspectives. What, what, what Sam Frankel and Bernard Bars are looking at is, okay, how, how do the things in working memory, how do they get there? Well, there's some broadcasting throughout the brain that gets a whole bunch of things involved in some network of high activity. And what Tononi is looking at is, okay, what does that lead to? Well, okay, it leads to a high degree of integrated information among, among, these, among these different things. And, of course, some of this structure is particular to humans, and I think that's kind of necessary. I mean, we have sensory memory and sensory motor memory. Okay, if, if you had a generally intelligent theorem prover or something, maybe it wouldn't have a sensory motor memory. So, I mean, there's... What we were trying to look at here was a cognitive architecture diagram for human-like general intelligence, not for any possible general intelligence. And I'll get more back to that point later. For long-term memory, I didn't find any existing system that covered that so well, but this is more the level that we've been thinking about things a lot with, with OpenCog. So, I mean, in the OpenCog design, as I'll elaborate shortly, we look at long-term memory as being composed of a number of different components. You have declarative or semantic memory, procedural memory for how to do things, episodic memory of your life history, attentional knowledge of what, what to pay attention to in what context, sensory motor knowledge, and intentional knowledge regarding what goals are appropriate in different contexts. And each of these is associated with different dynamics. So in some level or another, you know, learning about declarative stuff is, is, is reasoning. Learning about episodic stuff has to do with narrative and, and storytelling. And so that learning about what to pay attention to has to do with what's called credit assignment and also with reinforcement learning. So there's, there's a fair agreement within cognitive psychology of how human memory, long-term memory, is decomposed. And in, in many cases, there's knowledge of which parts of the brain deal with different types of memory. Like some, the parts of the brain dealing with episodic memory are distinct from the ones dealing with procedural knowledge and, and, and so forth. And again, there's a lot of human-specific stuff here, unraveling what's human-specific from what's sort of mathematically general is, is, is a whole other problem. Now, for motivation, and that, another key part of, of intelligence... <coughs> This diagram is a minor modification of one from one of uh, Joshua Bach's papers, which is the model called Psi that was created by Dietrich Jorner and ad adapted by, by Joshua. And that, that basically looks at the a action selection process. So you, you have certain basic drives that lead to certain motives that manifest themselves in certain situations. And, and then <clears throat> the system has certain actions that it chooses in, in an attempt to fulfill its current motives in, in, in the given context. I mean, in <coughs> open cog with a logic-based representation, we represent implications of the form context and procedure implies goal. And then given the current goals and the current context, the system tries to choose a procedure that it thinks will imply achievement of, of, of the goal. And so I encapsulate that process. We, we, we ended up in our work with Hansen Robotics combining Jorner and Bach's Psi model with uh, a different model of motivation from Wolfgang Scherer called, called uh, the component process model. I, I don't know why all the theory of motivation comes from Germany, but it's uh, Scherer, what he did was quite consistent with Donor and box model, but he went into more detail about what what modulates different actions and, and different emotions in terms of specific body type parameters and tying tying it in with with arousal and the way the eyes and the mouth work and the muscles tense up and so forth. So that that's been useful for us in tying in the motivational model with the Henson robots, which are physical robots that 
that look like look like people and have motors and, and, and sensors and so forth. So there's there's a there's a lot there, just like there's a lot in, in each of these areas. Perception I mean this is something that we've heard a lot about already and we'll hear more about. I mean in the human mind and human brain, vision and audition are relatively hierarchical. I mean olfaction, for example, smell is much less hierarchical. I, I know if, if you look uh, evolutionarily, our, our sense of, of smell and the part of the cortex dealing with that is, is, is pretty old, coming out of the, the re reptiles' uh, olfactory cortex. And Walter Freeman, one of the great neuroscientists I really admired, I mean, he, he studied the chaotic dynamics and sort of so, self-organizing dynamics in the recurrent neural network of the olfactory cortex. And it's, it's quite different than the hierarchical pattern recognition you see in, in vision and olfaction. Recognizing a smell, it's a bit more like the whole olfactory cortex settles into some distributed attractor, more, more, more like in an asymmetric hot field neural net than in the hierarchical back propagation neural, neural, neural net. And then we have cross connections between different senses and I mean in the brain it's quite specific all the, all the senses except smell converge in, 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 the, in the tectum but in an AI system you could converge the different senses in, in, a, in a lot of a lot of different ways but the point is they're not independent of each other I mean what you see can be impacted by what you hear and, and, and vice versa they're integrated and, and multimodal which is being explored in, in the machine learning community now and Movement, similarly, there's a hierarchical and, and sequential aspect. And of course, the movement hierarchies and the perceptual hierarchies, they, they interpenetrate at various levels, which is how we get, we get coordination to work. So that, that's a lot of different pieces. What, what we did there is took this initial diagram and blew most of those out into bigger diagrams. I think I, think I left out the diagram for language, actually which has language comprehension, language generation, and uh, dialogue, and so forth in it. So <clears throat> that's in the paper. I just left it out when making this presentation. But, and of course, you could drill down further and further. I mean, each box in each of these diagrams will become a, bu a bunch more boxes. But the, the point I wanted to make there is that there's actually a fair amount of agreement on, on that level. Like mo most cognitive scientists would agree on what are the basic processes that we need to handle. And there's a lot of data on how the different processes relate to each other and, and help each other or conflict with each other. Now, none of that tells you exactly how to build the thing, of course. It's more like a high-level requirement spec or, or, or something. Now, how can you build it? Well, here's, here, here's a sort of a scary diagram that I like to show whenever people tell me my own AI system OpenCog is too complicated. So, but so each, e e each of these rays here corresponds to a region of the brain that neuroscientists have identified by a combination of anatomical and, and, and functional means. And the lines indicate the cross-connectivity between the regions of the brain. So, I mean, it, it's interesting if you really spend time looking at it, because it shows you which, like, meta regions are more connected to which other meta regions. Now, each portion of the brain carries out a bunch of different types of function, and in many cases, it's not known what all of them are. Like here, I looked up, okay, the, the, co the caudate nucleus, which is this bit in the big diagram, the caudate nucleus is involved with curiosity, auditory perception, broadcasting, the new focus of attention, execution of selected action, long-term storage of word meaning, reinforcement learning of motor actions, kinesthetic perceptions, tactile olfactory perception, action selection, focusing of attention, and active procedural memory, and probably other stuff as well. So, I mean, if, if you take the various cognitive functions in the previous <coughs> diagrams I showed and try to map them onto brain regions, I mean, what you find is each cognitive function is split up among a lot of different brain regions. Each brain region contains a fraction of a lot of cognitive functions. 
So you wind up when you think about networks spanning multiple brain, brain regions, and each network corresponds to part of some cognitive function. I mean, it's, it's insanely complicated. I remember I, I, mean, I had a neuroscience textbook like that big, a cognitive science neuro te neuroscience textbook that big, and each chapter of the neuroscience textbook told about a little part of the brain, but it was really like an abstract of, of what's known about that part of the brain. And you'd have to read like a hundred papers at the end to really understand it. So it's, I mean, you could get the idea the brain is simple when you read like formal neural net models and you just have some neurons and synapses connected together. But I mean, there's many types of neurons, there's many types of neurotransmitters, there's many types of glial cells and astrocytes in, in, in between the neurons. There's a lot of chemistry happening and functions are distributed around in, in a complex pattern which is somewhat universal and somewhat individual, and in some cases can change over, over the course of, of your, your life within an individual person's brain, and in some ways doesn't change. So it's, it's, it's complicated. And if you thought about it in terms of software, this is one, it's one really cool and really complex way to fulfill like the requirement spec of, the, of those diagrams that, 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 that I was showing before. It also gives you a, a different view of, of deep neural networks, which I think are cool. And I'm going to talk about some of my current work with deep neural nets at the end of this talk. But if you look at it in terms of the brain, I mean, really what we're modeling with current deep neural nets for perception, it's, it's part of, in this case, visual processing pathway. It's a few parts of the brain and that you can somewhat model them as, as like hi hi hierarchical processing layers, but it's, it's a pretty small part of the overall brain story that, that, that we're modeling with the, these multi-layer multi neural networks. It's like a, a few of the pieces around this, the center in, in, in the previous diagram that I showed. And then we can take that and go further and further. So I mean, if, if, if you look at the differential neural computers from, from last year from DeepMind, I mean, what they were trying to do there was take some hierarchical neural nets that vaguely model visual or auditory cortex and connect it with this matrix memory, which they viewed as, as vaguely modeling the hippocampus. And then you're modeling some aspects of cortical hippocampal interaction in a way that does cool stuff, like na navigate around maps and, and, and so forth. And that's, I mean, that's interesting. If you, if you extrapolate from that, then instead of just these two pieces, you have like 300 pieces or something, each of them with a different neural architecture and connected with the others in some particular way. And then, then, then you'd have some sort of, of, of brain-like thing. But what's... What's important to remember, I think, is it would be hundreds of pieces like that. It wouldn't be like four pieces like that or something, because there, there's an awful lot of different sub-architectures and, and, and sub-dynamics sub going on. So with, with OpenCog, as with a number of other cognitive architectures out there, we're also trying to realize the, the requirements that constituted by, by those diagrams we're not using neurons and synapses, we're using nodes and links of a more abs abstract sort. And then to deal with different types of knowledge, like declarative, procedural, sensory, motor, episodic, and attentional, we're using different algorithms implemented to act on the same hypergraph knowledge store, like a lot probabilistic logic engine for dealing with declarative knowledge an evolutionary learning engine for learning procedures, some deep neural networks for, for dealing with perception. So this isn't an open cog talk, so I'm not going to go into that in huge detail. But the, the point I wanted to make is we can take a quite different architecture and try to realize the same sort of requirement spec in, in terms of what are the main cognitive processes going on. And I'm not going to try to explain that because I'm taking too long. The, that's a bigger diagram of OpenCog. So next, I want to talk a little bit about dynamics. So all these boxes and lines are pretty much about structure. Is there some abstract way to model what dynamics are, are, are going on inside an, an intelligent system? And one point of view I have pursued, which is 
in some ways similar to some of the stuff Alexei was talking about, is that you can view most cognitive processes that humans carry out as either sort of synthesis or analysis processes. And that, I mean, that is a lot in common with the generative and, and discriminative models. It's sort of a different way of looking at, at the same thing. I mean, the, a synthesis process I think of as basically a forward growth process. You have a bunch of things, you combine them in a certain way, you combine the combinations in a certain way, you combine those combinations in a certain way. It's like growth and, and proliferation. And forward chaining inference is like that in a logic engine. I mean, evolutionary process is, is, is like that in a, in a gen genetic programming system. You're taking things, you're combining them over and over again. Now, you also have analysis, which is the, the dual of that, which is a back, backward process. So there, you start with something and you figure out how could I build that? Then you want to figure out how could you build those things and how could you build those things? And that's, that's the reverse of the forward growth process. And of course, backward chaining inference is like that in a, in a logic engine. And actually you could view back propagation in, 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 neural net, in neural nets this way. Like, you know what output you want? How could I get that output? Well, how could I get that output? Well, how could I get that output, right? So, I mean, you, you have these very general logics, which you could model abstractly in a mathematical way, seem to underlie most cognitive processes. And I mean, they also underlie most biological processes, if, 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 if you think about it that way. I mean, the biological growth processes are everywhere. And evolution itself, you could view a, 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 as a way to do this backwards. Like, there's this fitness function, and how can I achieve this fitness function? Well, if I achieve this, I could do it. Well, if I achieve this other thing, I could get that. So, in a paper from AGI 16, which I'm going to sort of skip over the details here, it was called Probabilistic Growth and, and Mining of, of, of Combinations. But I tried to formalize a sort of probabilistic process based on, on these ideas. So, the, the essential idea there was that many cognitive processes could be viewed as a growth process like this where you have a number of entities and you probabilistically pick a couple to combine to get new entities, then you probabilistically pick a couple of those to combine to get new entities, and then you have some way to prune among the many things that, 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 that were created. So then you can mine patterns among which the combinations created were useful for something. And from that, that mining of patterns, you can then guide the, the pruning of, 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 of creating new things. So, and the same thing can happen going backwards, of course. If you have something you want to create, you can sample, you can probabilistically find a bunch of ways to create that then you can prune out useful ones. You can sample and probabilistically find a bunch of ways to create that. And you can mine patterns in which ones were useful. And, and then you can use the patterns that you mined from that to, to, to guide the, the, the ongoing uh, analysis process. And what I showed in that paper and, and some supplementary material was all the different AI processes inside the OpenCog system could be modeled as this sort of pruned probabilistic growth, either forward or backward. And so that gives a sort of general perspective on what previously looked like a sort of grab bag of different, of different algorithms. So as, as an example, our evolutionary learning system, which was called, is called MOSES, so I mean, that, that, that does a sort of estimation of distribution algorithm but how we look at that here is you have a bunch of, you have a fitness function you want to optimize. You have a bunch of candidates. You let the candidates combine with each other in some way. Then you prune out the bad ones, let the new candidates combine in another way. But then you're doing some probabilistic analysis to get a model of which candidates were successful. And so then you can use that probabilistic model to help generate new candidates. On the other hand, backward chaining inference, we have some logical predicate or proposition we want to evaluate the truth of. And in the standard way of backward chaining inference, we get some premises, and we hope we can use those premises to drive the conclusion. For each of those premises, we try to find some other premises that could drive that. But what, 
what Neil Geisfeiler, who works with us in OpenCog, is doing now. He's looking at a huge amount of examples of backward chaining inference done using our inference engine, and he's finding which combinations of inference rules work well in which contexts, and building a probabilistic model of which sequences of inference rules work well in what type of reasoning. Then from that probabilistic model of which sequences of inference rules work well in which contexts, you can then guide further backward chaining. So, so then when you, when you have some predicate and you want to find two things that might lead to that predicate, you, you are doing that guided by probabilistic knowledge of which logical combinations work well previously. In, in similar context. So we saw that in a whole bunch of cases, I just recounted two, which was probabilistic evolutionary learning and adaptive backward chaining inference. But in, in a whole bunch of different cases of the different cognitive processes, we had an open cog. We could, we could view them as either these forward growth or these backward analysis processes where you have some, some mining of patterns in which combinations worked well and then use of the mind patterns in which combination work well to help drive ongoing combination processes. And I formalized that with some math in, in my paper last year. Now that, that leads up to a concept I've been talking about a while, which is called cognitive synergy. And what that means is every growth process or every learning process will get confused sometime. And then it needs something else to help it out. So, I mean, suppose that you're trying to evolve the solution to some problem by having some initial solutions, combining them in some way, combining those in some way, and so forth, and pruning the combinations as you go. Sometimes that's going to work well. Sometimes it's just not going to work. You're going to generate a huge number of candidates in your evolutionary learning process, and you just can't tell which one is most promising. And then you, you have a horrible combinatorial explosion. Same way if you're doing backward chaining inference, sometimes you'll get some predicate and you just can't figure out how, how you might derive that predicate. You might have a billion things in your knowledge base, but it's not feasible just to try all, all combinations. So your, your reasoning process can get stuck, right? So the idea of cognitive synergy is that when one of the cognitive processes gets stuck, there should be another cognitive process that can take over for that particular task, and it won't be stuck. And, of course, that's not guaranteed to be the case. Sometimes you just get stuck. But the, the, the hope would be that if you're trying to logically reason to some conclusion, and at some point you reach something where you just can't logically justify it, well, okay, then... Then you look in your episodic memory from something in your life history that, 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 that will help. Or you, or you run a supervised learning task or something, and you hope that one of those things will help. So what, in that hypothesis, what you need is not one mega cognitive algorithm that will solve every problem. You need a bunch of cognitive processes, and when one of them gets stuck, meaning it hits an insuperable combinatorial explosion of possibilities, it can then appeal to another one that hopefully won't be stuck. Yeah. It sounds like you're talking about a, a type of modular redundancy that you would need for evolution. Is that correct? Um. I guess modular in the in the dynamical behavior, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. We could you could you could say that. So, in order for that cognitive synergy to work, you need the different learning algorithms to be sort of speaking the same language. And uh, Ray Ting and I explored that in a paper from earlier this year where we sort of looked at how you can map between knowledge and the language perception, action, and, and logic domain, where if you have a sentence like, uh, well, this wasn't a sentence, a phrase, smile at Bob, we represent that as a certain grammatical structure. Then in the perception domain, you have a look at, look at relation between a certain smile gesture and a certain face as a perceived object. In, in the action domain, you have two actions. One is like, I'm turning my head toward Bob. The other is I am moving these motors to 
make my mouth go up and smile toward Bob, right? In the logic domain, you have some predicate, predicate relation, argument relationships, like an at relation between smile and Bob, an evaluation relation between the predicate smile and the concept me. So what we showed in that paper is that you can construct morphisms in the category theory sense between this language grammar, this logical formulation in lambda calculus, and a perception and, and, and action grammar. So the, the idea is you have different domains of knowledge, you can represent them as categories, you can build morphisms between them. Then if some linguistic process runs into a dead end, it, the thing you're representing in language can just be mapped into something you could represent perceptually or logically. Then a cognitive process acting in perception or logic could help solve the problem that, that language got stuck in, for example. So, I mean, if you couldn't understand a sentence because it was too ambiguous or confusing, try to map what you think the partial sentence represents into pictures, and maybe you can, maybe you can make sense of it that way and guess what the rest of the language is supposed to mean, or try to map it into a logic interpretation. Maybe you can make sense of it, of it, of it that way by doing some deductions or something. So you need... You need mappings between the different domains. Now, I'm not arguing the brain has to implement category theory and morphisms and, and functors or anything. No, that OpenCog needs to, though in, in some contexts it can. It's just, an, it's just a way of, of, of modeling the underlying processes. And in my paper in this year's proceedings, I try to go a little further and model cognitive synergy with natural transformations in certain category diagrams, which I'm already taking too long since uh, it's late, so I'm not going to go into that. But you, 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 you can look at the paper. So I, I, I think you can use some nice math to model this at the abstract level. Now, similarly to the comments with free energy, although I... I'm not a huge fan of the free energy minimization principle, but I mean, it, it, it's similar in that when we take these mathematical models, I mean, we're not arguing like the brain contains a free energy maximizer neuron or something. And I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing that the brain or open cog contains natural, natural transformation diagrams. We're looking at a sort of high level conceptual model of, 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 what's, of what's happening. Now, Switch gears a bit. I want to look at a, yet another way of trying to come to a general understanding of what general intelligence is. So this ties in with some stuff that Alexei was talking about before also. So reinforcement learning is a common paradigm for talking about AI. You have an agent interacting with an environment. It acts. It gets some reward signal for what it does. It observes the environment. Then it tries to generate a new action that will get it more reward given its new observations. And there's, there's theory based in Salamanoff in, induction that says, in, in, a, in a way, if, if, if you choose a simple model of what in the past would have gotten you a lot of reward, then obeying that simple model of what would have gotten you a lot of reward in the past will probably get you a lot of reward in, in, in the future. And we heard about AXC already, so I don't need to try to exp explain it again, but that, that, that's one manifestation of a reinforcement learner that, you know, in, in computable environments can do arbitrarily well. The problem is it takes a, a, a huge amount of, of computing, computing resources. Now, the challenge with this kind of a approach is just to do reinforcement learning based on no background knowledge and no appropriate biases is pretty much intractable. I mean, in principle, you could do it. It would just take forever. So imagine, like, you, you go into some alien universe. It could be a 47-dimensional universe with some bizarre topology to it. And, you know, you have some body you've never been in before, which has a lot of weird actuators and sensors. And... You know, you just flail around randomly. Every now and then you get a pleasure or pain signal. And you don't know the geometry or topology of this space here, and nor what your sensors are, are or what your actuators are doing. So you just have to like form a compact model of, you know, which of your 
weird actions is giving you a pleasure signal based on all these sensations that are coming in, except you can only hold a few of these sensations in your memory at once, right? Now that, that's going to take you like trillions of years to figure out how to get pleasure and, and not pain. And so to, because you have, essentially have to do it by brute force search because you don't know anything about this universe or this body that you're in. So you're really just searching the space of all possible rules that could be mapping perceptions and, and rewards into actions, right? So to avoid that problem of needing to do intractable brute force search, you, in, in, in essence, you have to make some correct prior assumptions about, about the world that, that you're in and, and the body and the body that, that you're manipulating in, in, in that world. And that, that gives you what you call an, an inductive bias. And if you have the wrong inductive bias, you can do worse than if you just came into it and did brute, brute force search. But of course, we have a lot of the right inductive bias because evolution gave us that for the, the environments that, 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 we grew, that we grew up in. And this becomes an interesting thing to think about, like which aspects of our world did we adapt to, right? I mean, it's hierarchical structure clearly is a marked part of this world that we live in. And that's why parts of our brain have a marked hierarchical structure that does hierarchical pattern recognition. Because the, the world around us, in part, is composed of little things that build up into bigger things, that build up into bigger things, and, 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 and so forth. So that's, that's there. Now, it also happens we live in a regime of matter composed largely of distinct solid objects. And that's probably why we like to think so much about causality and divide things into pieces and so forth like well, I draw these diagrams with little blocks and lines between them right I mean maybe if I was an intelligent gas cloud living in, in the clouds of Jupiter or something I wouldn't think so much about cause and effect and I wouldn't like to make little box and line diagrams right because there's no blocks around me so a lot of things about our environment and our life history govern the, the way that we think probably in ways that we don't realize it occurred to me at one point that an awful lot of human intelligence is based on the inductive bias for what I called embodied communication. So controlling a body in an environment full of other bodies that we need to communicate and cooperate with to, to, get, to get things done. And I mean, we, we are in an environment where we need to do linguistic communication, where we need to point at things, do indicative communication, where we need to demonstrate things by, by sh moving around and showing people how things are done. We need to depict things by draw drawing pictures or Im imitating noises. And you know, we need to show what the goal is. Like if I want to walk over there and I want you to come, by walking over there, I'm pursuing that goal and therefore showing you what goal I want you to pursue also. So we live in an environment where we need to do these things all the time. And our thinking and the computational model in, in, inside our thinking is, is very much biased, in, biased in, 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 the, in this way also. So, yeah, this is an argument for doing AI with these funky robots like we're playing with in, in Hanson Robotics. And if, if you haven't seen them, you can look at Hanson Robotics Sophia on, on YouTube. There's a lot of videos of these robots. Now, I don't think you need humanoid robots in order to create general intelligence. I mean, I think eventually we'll have general intelligences tremendously more intelligent than humans without bodies that look anything like ours. On the other hand, if the goal is to emulate human-like general intelligence, which I think is a reasonable intermediate goal on the path to massively superhuman general intelligence, then the human body is what our intelligence evolved for and the inductive biases that the human mind has are in large part inductive biases for controlling a human-like body in a world full of solid objects and full of other humans who want, who want, to, want to communicate with us em emotionally and, and socially and linguistically and, and, and in, in a lot of other ways. So... One thing I observed is if you look at the different ways we have to communicate, these correlate with different types of memory that, that are well known in cognitive science. I mean, communicating in language relies heavily on declarative memory, 
pointing at things, this is a way of directing shared attention, which is an important, important aspect of memory. Demonstrating things is sort of having your procedural memory directly sync with someone else's procedural memory. Drawing pictures, of course, is direct straight sensory motor to sensory motor. And our goal system connects directly with someone else's goal system when you carry out joint, act, joint activities together and, and, and try to communicate in, in, in that way. So you can, you can look at the types of communication we need to do as being tied together with the different types of memory that, that we have. And then we have types of learning combined with those types of memory. And interestingly, of course, these things co-evolved, right? I mean, we didn't start out communicating so complexly in terms of, in terms of language. So, I mean, we, our, our, our brains used to be different. We started to live in these social environments and communicate all the time. Then that became the prior distribution that drove the, the ongoing probabilistic learning of both of evolution and of learning dur during a, person, a person's lifespan. But what we have now are brains that are in a sense, they're universal Turing machines. Like we could solve any computable problem if you gave us a big enough piece of paper to write on in a sufficiently long period of time. But the things that we're biased to be able to solve in tractable periods of time are, are the things that we evolve for, which are, are heavily conditioned by, 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 this, by this sort of, of prior. And so the, this, these types of communication that we evolved to do give you the types of memory that we have and, and, and the different types of, of, of learning that, that, we, that we have. And yeah, in, in another one of my papers for this conference, I try to lay out a series of formal models that begins with a very simple reinforcement learning agent and ends up, ends up with, with something like OpenCog. But as you take a simple reinforcement learning agent model and, and flesh it out until you get to something that can do embodied social interaction, I mean, you're adding more and more and more and more specialized things that are basically inductive biases for the type of interactions human-like agents need, need to carry out. And then I guess the question in terms of theorizing about general intelligence or building general intelligence is what's the most important bit? I mean, is the most important bit the very abstract process, like yeah, we're trying to get something in an, in an, in an environment and learn how to do it? Or is the most important thing all the other structures and dynamics that are baked in in order to bias us to be good at rapidly learning things in the types of environments that, that, that we need to? Because, I mean, we're not just talking about, like, okay, I live in the mountains, so I'm, I'm biased to be, to be very good at thinking about climbing or something. The, the bias toward intelligence in the context of embodied communication is, is a pretty fundamental t type of bias with some, with some philosophical meat to it. And that whole process of embodied communication may be more intricate and deep than the process of reinforcement learning itself, even though from an RL view, you're looking at it as a type of, of, in, of, inductive, of inductive bias. And the, that leads to the next thread I want to weave in, which is general intelligence as complex self-organization. So if you view human bodies or as just complex systems, complex combinations of, of, of chemicals and of, of biomolecules, you could look at intelligence as an example of complex self-organization. And I mean, this slide just shows two examples of that, which is birds flocking as collective behavior, and then a, a, chemical example of self-organization where some some amorphous cubes gradually form into very very orderly lattice of, of crystals just by locking into place without anyone engineering and placing them there so of course the human body has very complex self-organization and, and the brain does and self-organization acts along with evolution a related concept is what's called autopoiesis or self-creation and bodies and cells have this in an interesting way because I mean, when a part of a cell breaks, often often it can be replaced or rebuilt from other things in the cell. This is to do with also autocatalytic sets in, in chemistry and so forth. And people have modeled society that way. Society as an autopoetic self-building system, whose elements are communicating events, reproducing other communicative events. So 
if you look at the, the universe of communications as a self-organizing autopoietic system, and you look at that as sort of the embodied communication prior with respect to which we are inductively biased, all of a sudden the interesting thing seems like the self-organization and the, and the autopoiesis part, and referring to that as an inductive bias seems a bit artificial. And there's an interesting paper I'd recommend by uh, David Wambaum, a.k.a. Weaver. He gave a talk on this at the AGI conference in Berlin uh, in 2015 called Open-Ended Intelligence. And his view is that viewing intelligence as utility maximization is a sort of rape of the concept of intelligence, as, as, as he puts it. He, he just thinks that's very silly. And intelligence is an open-ended process of self-organization of a system coupled with an, with an environment and of expansion and growth and adding new patterns and new ideas and, and, and new forms. And yes, one thing a complex self-organizing system can do coupled with its environment is to maximize some utility function or achieve some goal, but then it may throw out that goal and choose another one and throw out that goal and choose another one. And I indeed have done that many times in the course of my own existence. I mean, as, as, as have we all, right? So from that view, utility maximization is an approximation of one game that some self-organizing systems sometimes play, but it's not the most fundamental aspect. And I mean, his perspective has a lot of complexity. I won't try to do justice to, but it's a good paper. It's, it's up on, on archives. So that the RL point of view and the self-organization point of view, they're two like quite distinct views of what general intelligence is in general. But you can, of course, link them together in, 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 very, in various different ways, as we've been discussing. So... I briefly want to run through one simple example of some recent AI work I've been working on together with uh, Ralph and, and Manhin and some, some others here, which has, has to do with integrating symbolic and sub-symbolic AI for perception. And I just want to summarize how even this relatively simple example hits all of the theoretical points that, 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 that I've been discussing so far. So. I'm not going to have time to go through the technical details here, but we, we're looking at taking a variation of a deep neural net called a GAN, which is quite popular, combining it with some open code symbolic AI methods to give a sort of semantic perception. So, I mean, in, in the generative adversarial network, in, in essence, you learn, you, you learn to build a, a model of a certain class of, of entities, say pictures of people's faces, by learning a model that can generate faces and also learning a model that can distinguish real faces from fake faces and it's it's set up as a sort of game where the generator network is trying to generate fake faces that look a lot like the real faces to fool the discriminator network into thinking they're real ones and the discriminator network is trying to tell the real from from the fake faces and that's uh, there's a variant of that called infogan with a generative network that's trying to generate faces that look a lot like real faces or numbers that look a lot like real numbers or whatever it is. The generator network has a set of latent variables which evolve in, in a certain way during the, during the learning process. And then the, the latent variables are a kind of structured noise that are used to generate the random thing, the random face or the, or the, or the random number. What's interesting about this is that the latent variables come out to indicate meaningful semantic aspects of the thing being generated. So if you're, if, if you're trying to use InfoGAN to generate numbers, for example, the discriminator network is trying to tell a real number from a fake number. The generator network is generating numbers. The latent variables of the generator <coughs> network, which are learned and unsupervised, they just appear rather than being programmed by anyone, the latent variables of that, of that generator network indicate different things. So one of them can indicate what number it is. Another one could indicate what angle the number is at. Another one could indicate how, how thick the number is and, and, and so forth. And these latent variables with a semantic meaning emerge out of the co-training of the generator network and the discriminator network. Now that's, that's Infogan, that's a few years old now. It, it's fairly cool. There's a bunch of variations on it. Now what 
what we've been looking at and are in the process of building it and experimenting with. This is still early stage. We call Synergan, and that, that's because we're looking at some synergy between the neural nets and probabilistic logic in, in OpenCon. So we have the same game with the generator and discriminator network. But the generator network is generating new faces or numbers or whatever it is using structured latent variables that actually are a bunch of nodes and links in OpenCog. So it's not just a list of variables, it's a whole probabilistic network of variables with complex dependencies between them. And the discriminator network in the same way can draw on complexly interdependent variables in a probabilistic logic system. In, in making its, its judgment. So both generation and discrimination are done by a combination of a neural network and, and, and then a symbolic network that, that work together. Then for training, you have to learn in a common way between the neural net and, and the, the probabilistic network and also for discrimination. And there, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of, of complex details in there. And then it gets, it gets even worse when you want to learn a whole scene because th this approach hopefully will be good for like learning a model of what is a person or, or what is a head or what is a pair of glasses or something and we'll emergently learn a logical model of each of these types of things but if you want to understand the whole scene like the one I'm looking at now that's piecing together a lot of these different specific models which can refer to each other like my model of a body can refer to my model of a head and my model of a, of a hand and so forth. So you need, you need a bunch of these neural symbolic models all, all connected together to, to each other. Now this, this is a fairly small piece of, of a general intelligence, but we can see that even this little piece incorporates all the major themes I've been going over so far. I mean, we're integrating different cognitive components in that boxes and lines diagram. We have both what we'd call forward and backward processes because we need on, on the on the generative side we're doing a forward process we're building something and that's forward chaining inference on the on the logic side and and it's generation in, in the neural net side then in the on the discriminative side you're doing backward chaining inference in the logic side and and of course you're you're doing back propagation all, all over the place now we're mapping between the patterns in the neural net, which is sensory motor knowledge, and then the patterns in the variables in the PLN logic system, which is, you know, probability theory layered on top of, of lambda calculus, basically. So we, we have this sort of morphic mapping between a perceptual domain and, and, a, lo and a logical domain there. And the whole idea is that if, if the neural net gets confused by doing very low level pattern recognition on pixels, then the logic system can, can help it out. On the other hand, if the logic system can't make an abstract distinction, maybe the neural net can tell the difference by, by looking at pixels in, in a detailed way, right? So you, you, you have this sort of synergy between two different processes that are looking at the same thing in, in, in different ways. And of course, you're building all sorts of inductive biases in here, like what, why are we using this hierarchical system in... In, 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 the, in the first place. And the whole thing is a self-organizing dynamical system. I mean, you, you're, you're co-training and, and co-learning all, 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 all these parts of it. You're exposing it to certain data, but it's self-organizing then into a certain state that's consistent with the stream of data that, that you're feeding into it. So I, I would say, in summary, I don't see that we yet have a great and grand overall general theory of general intelligence, but we have a lot of different overlapping general theories of general intelligence, and each of these general theories actually tells you something about, about a concrete case that, 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 you, that you're working on. Now, whether we can get more than that, I don't know. I mean, I, I started out with, with these guys who are taking the standard model from physics as a, as, a, as a metaphor, and maybe that's right. Maybe there will be something like the standard model from physics for AI. On the other hand, maybe intelligence is a different sort of thing, and we're always going to have a sort of overlapping constellation of different general theories representing different perspectives. 
and then you kind of bring them all to bear on each problem you're trying to figure out where bringing logic and neural nets together for perception is is one example of a problem where many different general theories can be pulled together to lend some insight and that that took much longer than I said, but I was ta- I was talking as fast as I could. <laughs> All right, someone had a question. Ben, have you had any exposure to uh, the work Stephen Wolfram has done in uh, symbolic discourse language? What's he up to? No, I've had a lot of a lot of exposure to Stephen Wolfram's work on, on cellular automata, but uh, I think he's gone beyond that. Beyond cellular automata, <laughs> well, in developing symbolic discourse language. Well, if you, if you don't, no, you don't know. That's okay. I don't. I, I I'm not familiar with that, with that. Okay. No. Actually, I I'm new to this. Uh, I mean, uh, ADI and also. We start from the DNC, for example, as we all know. Uh, the power behind this is because uh, we add uh, an external dynamic memory to the recurrent neural network compared to the neural network machine. The memory is, is uh, fixed, right? So, and all, all the process of fully uh, differentiable in the sense that uh, yeah. we, we, have, uh, we have a mechanism to Propagate backward and forwards the information along the process uh, along all of the system. Yeah, okay. open cog is not back propagation based, yeah. so, it's, so it's utterly different than okay. that. Of My question is uh, uh, about the this dynamic uh, memory. Uh, how is it? How how important is it in the open cog? Dynamic is memory is very important. Yeah, I mean, op- op- the central component of open cog. It's something we call the atom space, which is a big weighted labeled hypergraph that lives in RAM, and that, that is a giant dynamic memory. So, I mean, that, that's the center of it, yeah. Okay, uh, and then the second question is, uh, uh, what do you think the most efficient uh, way to propagate the, the knowledge? I mean, uh, for example, in the NC, it's by doing uh, different fully differentiable systems. Is there any other way, for example, uh, from Bayesian, variation of Bayesian, like that? Or I don't know. Uh, and the third question is, uh, you said uh, there are many uh, theory, uh, want to be general, right? general theory, but not really general. But I, I, I didn't see uh, at your presentation what kind of those theories so far uh, that uh, try to be mixed. For example, in physics, we have uh, Um, about your first question, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you're going to build an AGI by making a huge neural net and back-propagating o- 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 over it. So, I mean, whether, whether something is differentiable or not is one question. Whether doing back-propagation to exploit that differentiability is a different one. Because, I mean, our, our logic engine... In theory, that's differentiable because all the truth value functions are differentiable functions. But I mean, you're not, we're not going to back propagate. And I, I, I think recurrent back propagation has not ever really been gotten to work well in complex cases. I think if you were going to make a neural net AGI, it would be a very complexly recurrent network on which you're not going to get back propagation to work well. For specific problems, you can cleverly architect a network to work around that, but I doubt, I doubt you could do that for human level general intelligence. Now, about general theories, I mean, the whole theory in Marcus Hutter's book, Universal AI, is a general theory of, of, of general intelligence, which had to do with the AI XI model that, 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 was, that was brought up. On the other hand, on a more conceptual level, the theory of open-ended intelligence from Weaver's paper is a general theory. Now, the idea that 
that John Laird and Paul Rosenblum and these guys from the SOAR community have about how the mind works, which they're going to talk about in this symposium, this is also a different approach to making a, a general theory of, of how the mind works, which is, is more like my collection of box and lines diagrams approach, although they have different box and lines diagrams. So each of these is a different way of looking at, at what the mind is. And I mean, another, another, another way could be evolution-driven, right? So th th there's a lot of different ways to, to look at it. And I have not tried to enumerate how many theories there are. It's a fuzzy set, right? I, I mean, I've often said there are more AGI designs than there are AGI researchers. Because right? <laughs> e each of us has the one we're working on, then 10 others we'd also like to try, right? So, and th that might be true of, of general theories also. But there's not that many that have been articulated in, in a lot, in a lot of, 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 of detail. I, I, but... I would say between 10 and 20 or something, but I haven't tried to make a full list. Um, since the very beginning of AI, there's always been two fundamental human approaches. One is trying to simulate the human mind, the one example we know of actual working intelligent system, and the other is I'll call it the engineering approach. Essentially, a computer is a very different kind of engine than yeah. neurons. And so, uh, from your talk, I wouldn't even, I, I would say, say Marcus Hutter's approach with the universal AI is sort of neither of those. It's driven from abstract mathematics rather than from the human mind, brain, or the specific computing hardware that, 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 that we have at hand. And I would say that approach goes back to Solomonoff in the 60s. So there, there's at least been three fundamental approaches, right? Okay, but the point is a computer Yep. Whereas um, human brains just can't do that kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Things. So, I mean, in, in OpenCog in particular, I've been trying to combine those two points of view in the following way. The high-level diagram of parts and processes is inspired by human cognitive science, but the way each of those parts is realized is just, is just whatever works. So, I mean, the, the fact that we need to deal with declarative sensory motor and procedural and episodic knowledge is human cognitive science, but I'm dealing with declarative knowledge using a probabilistic logic <coughs> engine, which is clearly not what the human brain I implements based, based on various pieces of evidence. And I, I would say different approaches to AI hybridize these different approaches in different, in different ways, right? I mean, if you look at deep neural nets now, of course, the hierarchical neural net began as a loose model of parts of the human brain, mostly visual cortex. But if you look at everything that's done to get a system like Infogan or something, no one is trying to model the brain and mind with, with Infogan. It, 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 it's a mathematical construct. So, I mean, what I see is a sort of opportunistic and almost artistic mixing and matching of elements from, from mathematics, human mind modeling, human brain modeling, and then exploitation of, of the hardware that, that, that we have. And that mixing and matching is part of what makes it fun to design systems. Uh -huh. And you have another question from Dr. Uh, do you, for lovely lecture, uh, I remind you, memory very interesting thing for scientific and philosophy. Uh, for powerful memory, need uh, environment, education, nutrition, and genetic effect. Uh, when I see bear in the jungle Amazon, bird have no uh, European, bird have no nobody give me others. How better to find in the heart of jungle, Amazon, find a nest and home? One question important, do you believe memory exists also in space and time, 
of space time. Because space time different, space and time different. Which one? Can you? Been stumped. Yeah, well, I would say, according to physics, memory exists in space time. Uh, yeah, I, but I can't quite connect that to the various theories we were discussing here. Uh, yeah. But this is all, as far as I can tell, this is all in space time. Uh, yeah. Any other opinions on that? You were just saying like there are almost more uh, AGI ideas or architectures than AGI researchers, and um, it doesn't need to seem like everybody has their own idea of what AGI is, and they're working on that, of course, naturally. Um, but I wonder um, if that's the most efficient or effective way for this whole community to work, or if we should indeed work towards a general model of general intelligence, and then you know. Yeah work on different parts of it, or maybe identify things that we can uh, agree It'd on. It would be nice. Or, like, you know, peripheral things like, you know, evaluation platform or, or whatever. Like, I mean, I don't know how you do that practically. Because well, I've works, seen so. how it works practically. I mean, in the actual life, there's emerged one effective mechanism, which is to pay people. So, <laughs> I mean, it, if you have a lot of money, you can then pay AGI researchers to work on your idea even if it's not their favorite idea, because they want to eat, right? So, and I mean, that, that's sort of how DeepMind accumulated a lot of smart people who, who had different ideas, and probably still do, but they're working within a certain paradigm there, right? And that, that's how it seems to have worked so far. If, if you love your own particular idea enough, then if you don't happen to accumulate a lot of resources, you'll keep building it slowly, if you accumulate a lot of resources, you won't get other people to help you build it. And I think part of it is that this is an engineering discipline rather than just a science discipline. Because I, I also do some work in genetics, and there everyone is studying the same sequences of DNA, right? So there, you may disagree, but there's a common focus, and eventually you can convince someone you're right and they're wrong, because you're all trying to explain the same exact physical system that you're looking at. And I mean, neuroscience is like that too. But in AGI, I mean, we're each trying to build something, and each thing that what I build, what you build, what he builds, what she builds, may all be interesting systems, right? I mean, they may all be valid systems, and we may have a different aesthetic taste about which type of system is ideal to build. So then it becomes like a bunch of artists making different paintings. And then you're asking like, you know, shouldn't Picasso and Chagall have collaborated on painting one painting mm -hmm. instead of painting their own separate paintings? But maybe they shouldn't have, right? So I, I, I guess it's, uh, yeah, th th there's a lot of ways to look at it. But if, if, if you're asking how we would get to building a thinking machine fastest, I... I think more, more cooperation than we have now would be optimal, but probably not monolithic cooperation. Like if we had one AGI Manhattan project with all AGI researchers working on it, that probably isn't optimal because what if that had the wrong idea, right? <laughs> then everyone's, everyone's in, in the wrong direction. But I, you know, I've tried a lot of times to get the community to collaborate in some way and have failed each time. So I mean, this paper that Matt and I wrote, what I wanted to do was get a bunch of people to agree on sort of a high-level diagram and then get each of them to cooperate and sort of map the parts of their own system into this high-level diagram so we could see, like, okay, uh, well, how does Elbukov do this? Well, how does Lada do this? Well, how does Sor do this? Well, how does this guy's deep neural net do this? So then if you had a common architecture of the processes... And then each person's system was mapped into that common diagram of, of human cognition processes. Then, then you could start to map my vocabulary into Pei Wen's vocabulary or Stan Franklin's vocabulary. You'd have a sort of common glossary coming out of the labels on the common set of diagrams. And then perhaps you could see how to 
combine different people's insights with, with, with each other. So I tried to do that. I organized a few workshops and conference calls and so forth. And eventually, I found it personally very tedious to try to get other people to do something they don't want to do and just went back to doing my own research. Right? And I think many others have had the same experience. Uh, I think bu building common environments for experimentation is a useful thing to do, but doesn't really solve that problem because what happens is each team would favor an environment that pokes the issues that they're most interested in and that makes their own system look better, right? So, I mean, people who are, who are dealing with movement and vision will want a robot environment. People who think language is more important will want to make their system pass some written I IQ test or, or something. So, coming on a common environment becomes almost uh, like an isomorph of the problem of, of, of coming to, to a common a, a approach in, in, in practice. Another question over here? I, I just had a specific question about the info again, sin again. Okay. Um, what, uh, what exactly does the probabilistic model do? Like, I'm familiar with info again, but what, what did um, how, how, could you say a little bit how it interacts with the gamma with those latent variables which represent some magic for? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, in, in essence, if, if you're doing, in, in the generative step, what, what, what you need to do is to set values for the latent variables in a way that takes into account the dependencies be, between, between the latent variables, right? So you're, you're doing forward chaining PLN inference in OpenCog and that forward chaining inference runs for a while, then you have a node probability value associated with each of the concept nodes that correlates to the latent variables in, in, in the GAN network. So in, in, in essence, the forward chaining inference in OpenCog is, is, is taking the role of generation in, in the Bayes net, if you had the Bayesian GAN. Thanks. Thank no. you.